All right, so today we're going to talk about plane elasticity. Plane being 2D, right? Not like, a, uh, not like plane as in bland, right? Plane as in 2D. Uh, elasticity, that's all we're going to solve in this class. Uh, the extension of 3D is really straightforward. It's just more computationally expensive. and you know, Conceptually, there's nothing new to learn when you go from 2 to 3D. However, going from 1 to 2D, or, or specifically going from scalar fields to vector fields, so the, the lectures that you were supposed to watch, you covered 2D scalar fields uh, and also this isoparametric mapping stuff, which is really what, I, honestly, it's really important to finite element analysis. Without the isoparametric mapping and the Gauss integration, finite element analysis would not be as popular as it is because it would be far too difficult to integrate this difference matrices. Uh, yeah? So we allowed the Jacobian to be negative. Is that true? Can we do that? No. No, it never should be a negative. Uh, you can get, numerically, you can get negative Jacobians. Essentially what happens there is that the matrix inverts on, on it, the, or the, the element will invert on itself. This can happen in large deformation problems. Um, you'd have some check in your code, and you'd prevent that for some reason. Uh, you'd either refine to prevent it, or, you know, typically that is leading up to some type of, you know, to get that much deformation in a single element, you, you really, you probably have plasticity and other things. And really, before that would happen, you'd probably have material failure in reality. And so you'd, you're going to pass something, you know, you're going to do something special in that case. The, the easiest thing to do if you're really trying to model material failure is to do so-called de element deletion. So you'd actually remove that element from the simulation. And that's sort of the most popular and the easiest thing to do. Uh, abacus sort of, it's the brute force way to do it. Of course, it's not accurate because you're like sort of just removing mass out of it. So it's not physically accurate. But it will keep your simulation together. Uh, you know, the more physically accurate things to do involve, you know, extended finite elements, or you know, the, you're, you're leading to cracking or failure in that case. Right. So, uh, yeah. But all all finite element codes will check the Jacobian and make sure it's always positive. And in, in you know, usually well before that, when it starts to get ill conditioned, they'll do something else. You know, refine, do something else. Yeah. Uh, so that's a good point, but it you know that's really important to know, and we'll use that for the rest of the class. Even though the problems we're going to solve in this class will be small enough that you could get by with some other, you know, scheme of integrating. It, it, you know, th this is the way all finite element analysis is done. That the it's, it's one of the most important contributions to the field, is this notion of the parent element mapping. Um, so we'll use that when we do these plane elasticity problems and everything. So plane elasticity today, and then. Uh, of course, then we've already solved for 2D uh, scalar fields, which you can think of a scalar field as pressure, right? Pressure diffusion. So now we'll know elasticity, we'll know pressure diffusion, then we can sort of put them together, and we have poor elasticity. Right? And that's that's sort of where we're going. Um, there's already a homework assignment is due a week from today. So while I've given you an extension till next Monday on the assignment you have, there's already another one due. So get it get going right because I think you know you've had long enough on this other assignment if if you need more time it's only to probably just ask me one question or something you should have had 90% of the 99% of the code should be done and working at this point right so anyway plain elasticity yeah. So what's the difference in Oh, uh, I'm not going to cover that. We won't do that. But you can you can define a uh, you can define an isoparametric parent element for a triangle element. It's just like a perfect right triangle, and you just you can define a mapping back to that. So your your reference coordinates would just start in the lower left hand corner of the of the parent element, and you know. I know triangles are really popular, but they're not very good elements, actually. So, uh, you know, we're just going to use quads. And I, I suggest when you do real fine element analysis, you should use quads. Uh, triangles are really popular because it's easy to mesh things, right? It's really easy to pay, create a mesh with triangles. But, but they're not very good elements for a lot of reasons. So the, the, in fact, a very popular um, fine element frameworks like Deal2, which is one of the best ones out there, they don't even support triangle elements. So, all right. So, plane elasticity. We we already know the equations. Um, if you recall, it's just 
the conservation of momentum. I'm going to write out all the terms. I don't know if we, you know, we might have just used the grad operator when we wrote this out before. And we're going to neglect the three component because we're just dealing with two dimensions. All right. Now I've avoided doing this in the in the class so far because uh, you know I didn't necessarily want to tie the components to any particular x y z coordinate system. But since now we're kind of dealing with finite elements and we have numbers, we have element numbers and node numbers and we already have a lot of numbers um, and I don't want superscripts and subscripts all around my variables I'm gonna switch now uh, to using this notation so sigma 1 1 is gonna become sigma XX sigma 1 2 will be sigma XY I think I mentioned this when we covered this and I, I you know I'm all positive you guys will have a problem with this because it's probably the notation you're more familiar with anyway. All right. So now we're also going to sort of introduce a vector notation instead of using the tensors. It's easy. The tensors are far more easy when you have three dimensions, but in two, um, it's easy enough to switch to the vector notation. So we only have those three non-zero components of strain, stress. I'm going to define an operator, a differential operator. It looks like this. We already covered this in the 2D case, uh, what this differential operator does, right? It just in the 2D scalar fields, uh, but it's a little bit different here. So with those two, with this definition of the stress vector and this definition of the differential operator, I can write my equation like this. Right. So in vector notation, those two equations above can be written compactly like this, right? Where B, uh, the B vector is BX, BY, the U vector is UX, UY. Right. And since we have this differential operator, remember, ultimately, our stresses are functions of strains. And the strains are functions of displacement. So we can use that same differential operator if we, if we introduce a strain vector, then that's simply the differential operator applied to the U vector. Right? And you can just see that by inspection, right? It's uh, if we if we if we trans if you transpose this guy and then multiply it by uh, multiply it by the stre this stress vector, then we just get the individual components of strain. And just for completeness, the strain vector would be like this. And if you remember, if you don't remember where the two comes from there, you can go back and watch those videos where we covered the plane elasticity. So then our constituent model. which is the relationship between stress and strain, we'll also write in matrix form, since we have vectors now.
All right? So then we can write that equation like this, where this is our matrix now. Okay, and the components of the matrix are functions of the elastic con constants, right? Young's module, you know, pick your two elastic constants you want to use and plug them in. Young's modulus and shear modulus, lemmas, parameter, Poisson ratio, whatever. And they will be different depending on if the problem is plain stress or plain strain, right? So that, we're just going to leave it generic like this. Your choice of C's will be dependent on if you're solving a plain stress problem or a plain strain problem, okay? But if we leave it generic like this, the equations will be the same for both, and only the choice of constituent model. So then if we plug that back into our equation, we have, and I'm going to re rewrite it a little bit, I'm going to put the divergence of stress on the left-hand side. That equals to rho b plus u double dot, right? And the only reason is I put it on the left-hand side because just because we're going to, make some modifications over there, only on the left-hand side. So plugging in this guy for stress, then we have D transpose C E and then we plug in our definition for using the differential operator for strain, right? Then we have D T C D U, right? Okay. We also have boundary conditions. <clears throat> so these are on the boundary, or you know, we can write it like this. These are the natural boundary conditions, specifically. And then we also have the essential boundary conditions. U of x equals u zero x u y equals u zero y on the boundary. So these are on the Neumann boundary, these are on the Dirichlet boundary. Yeah? Can you explain the physical meaning of natural boundary conditions? Uh, well, we covered that when, I mean, this, this was a, this is a, well, this is a consequence of when you develop the weak form, you'll see it in just a second. When you develop the weak form, this pops out. But remember, in the 1D case, when we developed the, the weak form for uh, elasticity, what popped out was like a, a term that was uh, like partial U, partial, some EA, partial U, partial X, right? Well, EA, partial U, partial X is stress, right? Right? And so, you know, and then we replaced that with some traction. Or we replaced... E A partial U partial X with P in the weak form, right? So it, it went in. So it's a boundary, it's a boundary stress. You know, it's a boundary traction, traction boundary. Yeah. So you'll see that on the what's on the right hand side pops out of the weak form, and then we just plug in T X and T Y, which they're applied far field boundary conditions, right, to those services. Well, not far field on on the surface. They're, no, no, they're just on the surface. Right? I didn't. I shouldn't have said it's far field. So now that you wrote everything in U, mm -hmm. then you want to like apply the natural transformation to transform uh, these tractions into displacement. No, no, they just uh, they just you just put the traction in there. You'll see it when it comes in the weak form. Uh, it, it's just the traction you apply. It's, it's no problem. The the essential boundary conditions are the U's, and you have to apply those the same way we did before, right? There's no difference. You, you have to modify the stiffness matrix and stick it on the right-hand side, right? So 
I'm not going to go through all the steps of the week form because it's it's the same as what we've been doing. You multiply, you know, it's, it's no matter what the PDE is, you multiply by test function, integrate over the body, integrate by parts. So I'm not going to go through all those steps again. This is just math. I'll just write it down. So we're going to integrate over the volume of the element. All right, but we're in 2D, so the volume of the element is going to be some thickness of the element, H, right, H-E, times the domain of the element, which is, you know, the area, essentially. So independent of Z, then we have the integral... So the, the top equation is the weak form of conservational momentum as we defined it earlier in the class, right? So it's all in tensor notation, and that's valid in 3D, right? So now we're going to specialize to the plane case. That's all we're doing here. Integrate over dx dy. The body forces, these would be, you know, the generally gravity. And then integrate over the surface of the elements. So just to be clear, the first one is the weak form derived from the conservation of momentum. And I just wrote it down, but if you went through the steps, you, in the integration by parts, you'd get a boundary term, you'd get the boundary term over here, and it would be functions of stress. So it would be sigma x, x, n, plus sigma y, y, n times the test function, right? Then we replace those with the, bound, with the boundary conditions that are different. You know. If, a, if they exist, right, then we replace them. All right. So that we specialize the first equation there uh, to 2D. And then if we use our definitions, our vector definitions, we can write this quite compactly. Okay. So that is the weak form in vector notation. Now we just have to introduce our Galerkin approximation. So 
So we're going to have that u of h is equal to u h of x and u h of y, which is approximately equal to n j u x j n j u y j. Or if we write that in vector notation, we have a matrix n times our vector u. Okay, and the matrix n then looks like this. And in that case, uh, so there's little n number of uh, shape functions, right, big N. So that's depending upon the interpolation order that you prescribe, right? And, and the reason the zeros are in there, of course, if you multiply the vector, you only want the first row to operate on the uxs, right? And then the second row on the, U, on the uys. So just to be clear, this u, maybe I should use a little bit different symbol. This is not the continuous u. Um, maybe I should use a different symbol, just that's sort of confusing. It's not the continuous u, but it's the unknown displacements, right? And that is a total vector, right? It's ux1, uy1 ux2, ui2, uxn, uyn transpose, right? Okay. And then del u, via our Glurkin approximation, is just n. Okay. Just our strain, if we had d, uh, u before, What? No, 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 no. It's a vector, right? And I multiply it by n, then I get n1 ux, n plus n2 ux, right? So it's right. It's a vector. See my transpose? So this is really, I wrote it as a row, but it should be a column. If I multiply that by that, then I get what I want. Yeah. So uh, the strain, I, I need to also in, introduce my approximation here, okay? And so, so if I do that, so this is like U H now. So then I get D N uh, D. Well, these are the unknowns. And this thing we call the strain displacement matrix. So really, it's just that differential operator applied to the uh, end matrix. So you can see that the strains are fully defined by the derivatives of the shape function. Right? And then times the unknown. So then if we plug it all in then, uh, we have the integral over the domain H E B transpose C B D X times the unknown displacement D plus rho N transpose N dx d double dot minus h e rho n t 
b dx minus h e n t t ds right and so then in the definitions we've used before this is the stiffness matrix this is the mass matrix this is f this is q right so then we just have k e d plus m e d double dot minus f minus q right equals to zero and in quasi statics which we'll mostly be worried about in this class you don't you ignore the inertial term and everything just collapses down to k e d equal to f right which is equal to f minus q f plus q all right so i've already posted a, a video then of an example of how to develop this for a triangle element okay so this is just for a single element We'll talk about assembly next time. So there's an example you can watch where I actually code that up. Okay?